How much time do we have? Yeah. How much you want? Uh, <laughs> no, how much you can bear. <laughs> uh, if, if people start fainting, I, I will try to trap them. Okay, just... Uh, uh, so, I guess we plan for something around an hour. Uh, we were expecting to have, uh, yeah, slightly close. Um, leave room for other people. And um, to, ma to make it easier, we can also make a pizza break halfway. <laughs> yeah, maybe a little nap and then get back around midnight too. <laughs> okay, let's do that. Uh, so, um, so this is teamwork. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to we are going to show you uh, um, uh, to 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 explain to you or to try to explain to you what we what we we are doing and what we did at that match. And I titled that that talk a life beyond relational database. Uh, it's a bit, little bit provocative, I know, um, but uh, I love relational database. Uh, it's just a matter that uh, uh, we were trying to do something different. And um, so the idea of this talk is to uh, introduce you to uh, uh, some uh, technique, which is called uh, some principles of designing, which is called event sourcing, that you might probably know already. But how we do it, practically speaking, in Haskell, in, in, in Haskell and Capital Match and why we are doing it, and uh, how far we are pushing it. Uh, how many of you are familiar with event sourcing? Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, okay, so not that many people. Uh, actually, there are the, we, we are three in front of you, but there is a, there, there is a fourth person by in the back, which is all you, we ju just recently joined the team. So we are now four full-time developers uh, working on, uh, on this. Um, so the agenda, I will, uh, so I will give a quick introduction. Uh, we will then talk, uh, I will be talking about the event sourcing model. I, will, I won't try to go into too much, I will try to give you the idea behind it. It's pretty obvious, basically. Uh, I think it's pretty obvious. Um, uh, but uh, the reasoning behind it and what, it, uh, what, what is it, uh, what, what's the impact of this technique on the architecture and design application is quite deep, so that might be interesting. Um, and so this will be the this will be the uh, the painful part where we, where I will only be talking and showing slides, and then will, there will be an interesting part where Amar and Goyan will show you actual code. Uh, so uh, that will be the, the second part of the talk, uh, which where we took the inclination and usage, and there will be um, a third part where I will I will talk again. Uh, apologies for that. But I will talk about uh, what we plan, how we plan to evolve our current system. To take into account our, uh, different uh, different features and requirements um, that we are planning to, to build into, into the system. So who, who are we? Um, uh, so we are Capital Match. Uh, this is the ca screen capture of the, of the website. Uh, this guy is very happy. So you can see that we are we are selling happiness. Um, actually, not. Uh, we are uh, the leading peer-to-peer -peer platform in Singapore uh, when uh, lending to SMEs. Um, and our system was, so we, we started the uh, operation in 2014, but well, legally speaking, we started in 2015, but uh, we started implementing the system in 2014. Uh, and the backend system is mainly developed in Haskell uh, with the front end. Uh, we, don't, we won't talk about the front end because the front end is, is developed in ClojureScript. Um, so this is a Haskell meter group. Uh, I will try to join the closure script or closure meter group. <laughs> 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 um, I, I actually I, I found a good way to <coughs> for people to pay me beers. So uh, I'm traveling around the globe presenting that stuff to various groups. So, so you can be, you can buy me a beer. For that. Um, and the core development team. So uh, there is Amar, uh, Arno, I must uh, Amar, Arno, uh, Golan, and Joy. Um, as you can guess from my accent, I'm not uh, English or an English native speaker. I'm French, and I'm, I, I'm actually li living in France, and uh, I'm working most of the time remotely. And sometimes I come to Singapore to meet people, discuss, and, and drink beers. Um, okay, so uh, down to the uh, the meat of the talk. Um, so um, we we all know what the original model is. We have been. Uh, we have been brought up in that model, we have used it for a long time, we have been taught how to use it at school or at, at university. Uh, 
um, uh, the canonical uh, example of the interaction model with the employee person address and the database. Um, and what's good in rational what, what what do we love in rational model? The, the first thing we love is a really great for query. It's really great. It's, it's a great model to start querying and generating reporting tables, extracting data, gathering data from the from, from the model. And actually SQL rocks uh, for that. It's really a great language for querying stuff. Um, uh, and SQL has evolved over time. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really powerful language, and if you take into account the extensions that are built in some databases, it can get really, really powerful. I'm thinking so. I, I got a friend of mine who's working, uh, he's really an expert in Postgres, uh, and uh, he showed me, he, sh he, he, he has shown me things that are really amazing what you can do with the uh, built entire system in Postgres, uh, for example, doing stuff with geographical data, which is pretty basic, by the way. So. Um, so its concept flow is very simple to understand. It's, it's everything is a table, basically, and then you can start jumping them. Pretty simple. And then you build the full uh, algebra over it. Um, and a third advantage is that, uh, which might stem from the two, uh, the two others, is that it's pretty ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Everywhere you go, you will have at least one or two databases to, to get data from. Uh, and it's it's really uh, it's really everywhere. It's been around for forty years, for fifty years. So no surprise. Um, the question is, what's wrong with the national model? Uh, what's maybe not wrong, but maybe less less more painful. Uh, Rise and deaths. I mean, when you write into database, okay. If you are inserting one data, yeah, sure, no problem. If you start inserting, uh, if you start using transactions, updating data here and there on the database, maintaining integrity, you need referential integrity, you start to think, oh, but I, how, how, do I, how do I maintain that? I start to have, need to have primary keys, constraints, whatever. It starts to get pretty complex. Um, there is the so called internet mismatch. Um, I've read articles in read there about. Uh, that the latest mismatch can actually be a straw man, but I really do think that, well, in real life, when we're at least in real life, in my life, uh, a lot of time I've been dealing with data which, which was not really that much relational. I mean, most of the time, a lot of the time, data is mostly trish, so trish is still okay, uh, but then graphish, and graphish can be pretty painful to model in the database. We can do it, obviously. I mean, uh, I'm pretty sure that. A uh, lot of the data in Facebook is stored is, uh, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a rational model. But uh, there's a reason why there has been a flourishing of non-only uh, non, non SQL or non-rational models in the, in the past years. Is that because after, after 30 or, or 40 years of using only exclusively rational model, and I, I, I come from a Java background uh, initially, and um, well, I've been beaten by Hibernate one too many, so uh, <laughs> I've been beaten by that in business and such. Um, and then another advantage is that um, I've been, that might not be true everywhere, but every, at all the places I've worked, the database soon became uh, a single point of failure and it became the most critical asset you had in the company and something that was, I mean, uh, more, more important than the Chrome jewels. Uh, because obviously, yeah, your data, your data is, is very important. Uh, but your data, the data was sitting inside, was residing inside the very complex system. And uh, I look at you, I, I look at your Oracle, uh, which which is something that when you want to start using that and deploying that and maintaining that, it can get some good uh, uh, And there is a reason why uh, database administrators are much more paid than developers because they are more important, because everything is in the, is in the, the relation. So, um, and then the cherry on the topic, that basically what is a, what is a relation database? It's, what is a database? It's, it's, it's mutated state. It stays, where, which can mutate. So, of course, I've seen that, and I've seen, I've implemented that. You can model immutable state with mutable states, and you can start uh, storing uh, Data with uh, version version events or timestamp or whatever, but you can do that, of course. But 
basically you still have a mutable state. And once you once you update the database, once you update your row, and once you change your row, back, yeah, the data is gone forever. Well, not always, but basically forever. Um, if you are unlucky and do delete forever. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So uh, in the end, what we end up is is that we end up in a, in, a, in a world where everything is ruled by the database. Uh, there is a, uh, one single ruler, which is, we have that, I've, I've worked on that kind of system, so I've been envisioned by that. And it's, it, and you have the, 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 the database server, which, which sits at the center of the, of the universe, and then everybody is talking to it and trying to work with it and trying to adapt, and then, oh, but I need my table there, oh, but by the way, there are naming conflicts, oh, but then we need naming rules for tables, and then we start to add schemas and schemas of schemas and then we start to have schema reconciliation <laughs> meetings and groups and whatever but now, now I, i'm talking about real life here <laughs> and, and, and and it's i mean and 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 well i didn't want that <laughs> when, I, when we started working on title match i didn't want to, to go into that nightmare and besides i'm not the database administrator i'm not an expert and i didn't want the burden of maintaining a data of course we could have used that a, a database of service uh, What's about, what Amazon provides or any other service providers, but in the end, you have to put your hands into the yes, well, and the Android's event sourcing. So, what is event sourcing? Uh, uh, in a nutshell, event sourcing is it takes the ID, the basic ID, I mean, which is obvious for anyone who has computer science, that well, uh, basically what we are manipulating is, is a world where we have states and we are transitioning into states. A lot of Probably 99.99% of what we're doing can be modeled like that, right, with more or less usefulness. But the idea behind that is that yes, we are transitioning between, between states. Uh, the database, uh, database is actually something that say, okay, I'm in one state, and then there, there is uh, something that are, that are rules outside which says how can I transition from one state to the other. So the, the, the database is actually the state, or one state among all the states, all, all the possible. States. The idea of event sourcing is to say, well, but what about the transitions? Actually, we have one state here uh, at the end, and this state, we can arrive at this state by two routes. And we can say that, after all, only the state is important. But uh, actually, knowing how we get there might also be very important. So that's the basic idea of event sourcing, is to start thinking about so in the end, we always have state. Of course, we have, we have something which we, we have a, uh, uh, we have we are we are at some point in time. But the idea of it is something to say this point in time is a, is a result of uh, all the events that occurred to that led to that, to that to that state. And what we are interested in, we can we can query the state. But we can also travel time and we can also manipulate the events that went back to that went that that led to that state. And the core data the, the the database that we are manipulating is actually the stream of events leading to this data so that's the basic idea um, uh, and that's what's in uh, in the slides uh, and besides once you have the traditions when you once you know what what, what has been the tradition you have been through then you can be much through this data providing let's say the deterministic of course we will leave the details out for a map uh, so event sourcing <coughs> came out. Uh, this is a quotation from guess what, Martin Porter, um, and uh, he wrote that article somewhere in the mean, mid twenties, uh, so somewhere in two thousand and five. Uh, so event sourcing is basically the idea that um, what we store as what we persist in our system is are the transitions, are the events that impact and change the state of the system and not the state. So we still have the state, of course, but the state is in memory all the time. It's reconstructed all the time and when the system crashes or when we boot the system or when we want to restart everything, we reconstruct the state and when we want to change the state, what we do is that we apply an event and we change the state, but we, we store the event itself, not the state. Um, once you get events, uh, once you have those events, then it gets easier to get something which, which banks love, auditing, auditability of 
your, your state is something that's very important for a lot of people, especially for financial institutions and banks. Uh, so the idea is that, well, you, you know, you, you can know precisely what sequence of events led to that state. How, how come there is uh, $1,000 in this account? Well, you know, we have all the tensions, and obviously that's obvious for, for banking. So that, uh, there is actually a very close, um, it's very cl it's a, there is a very pro a high proximity between the model, the conceptual model, and the actual model of the transaction ledger. But it, it, it's, it's also true for any kind of model in magic. Knowing where, why, you, why you, 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 you are in that state is very important. Uh, you can implement pretty easy, very easily generate undo and redo mechanism. So you can you can start trolling and say, oh, but what? Why? I, 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 I did this event on my model, but I don't want it, so I can troll back in time, uh, which makes it very easy to run simulations of a rack of this. Uh, one thing I, I've been working uh, at, a, at a, a company which was doing uh, which was doing financial software, and one thing which was really really hard to do and which was really Critical part was simulations, simulating bars, simulating uh, por portfolio evaluation, for example, according to different events. Assuming that, for example, yeah, you got the spot, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, euro USD spot forward changes. What happens to your portfolio? Then, basically, what what you can do is that you can recall that event and then recall other events and and get back in time. Okay, but if, if I don't want that. Um, it's somewhat easier to go with data migrations. Migrations, when you are migrating your, your database, your original database, uh, it, it can be done. It's, it's there, are, there, 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 there is a software that uh, I implemented the library that was, uh, that was working over Liquibiz, which was a, a, new, a software for doing that in Java. It's, it's, always, uh, it's always something that's a bit painful. <laughs> So you can do it, but it's not very easy. In our case, when we're doing, when using it, it anyway, it's, it's always something which is rather painful, but the, the, the good news with event sourcing is that migration is actually something that's really local. It's only local to the format of the event that you want to change. If you don't change anything, anything else in the system, if you, even if you change your model, actually the, 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 the model that you are, um, that you are using in, in RAM, you don't have to change your events, you just have to change the interpretation of your events on your model, which means that you don't have to migrate your data, which is pretty powerful. When you have to migrate your data, it can still be painful because yeah, you have to reconstruct and there, there are migrations that you can't reverse, of course, but it's easier, it's more localized. That code is still not, not, not nice. We have to do some, re some we have to live with that. Uh, and uh, another thing is that you, you can deal more easily with potentially conflicting change. What uh, in relational database systems, uh, the transaction ledger is actually uh, an event sourcing system. What happens is that, that the, the, the RGBMS records the sequence of uh, even the sequence of the sequence of changes to data, and once the transaction is committed, it just compares the ledgers and applies if there is no conflicting change. And that's what what does in sourcing is only giving you that power, giving that power into your hands and refining that journal system. Just, but just you, you now manipulate it directly. Uh, so uh, uh, and uh, uh, an even more important thing is that um, events drive business. When when you are starting to think about to, to designing some business when you are working with business people, business people will talk, if I do this, I, then this happens. And if I do that, then this happens. And then you can model it in terms of condition and state and condition, but transition and events are really important. Uh, and they, they represent, the, they, they represent the, the domain model very, very faithful. That's, that leads to some interesting techniques, design techniques, which I won't go into the state of, which are part of domain-driven design that we have heard of. Uh, Event sourcing is orthogonal to domain driven design. The domain driven design can be done more easily with event sourcing. The way you can extract events and start to think really in terms of business events, and not only technical events. Um, and there is even a, a recent, or more or less recent technique for event storming, which applies this, this principle, but for really for requir uh, requirements and or uh, so. 
the only, or, or user story mapping in terms of agile terms, where you would really work with business people to start it. Um, okay, so that, those are the principles. In practice, what happens? What we do in practice, and I will go, I will go very quickly through those slides because you, you, you will show the, we'll show you the actual code uh, after that. Uh, so, basic the basic architecture of uh, of a service that we that we implement is goes uh, that way. So we have uh, some REST API with some JSON coming in, and then we have our our, our functions that call services. Um, and then we have those services that talk to some even sourcing engine in the between and this uh, those services can talk to different models so for example here yeah, we can talk yeah, we, we have a, a model for, for managing facilities and we have a model for managing investors and we can and we can act on those uh, and then the generated events are persisted into an event store uh, so the core the, the, the most important thing is that the business model is pure, pure in the sense that it's immutable. You can't, and it, it, it lives in the pure realm of hospital where everything is pure and there is no IO, you cannot fire missiles, you cannot change the world, you can touch fire, you can do nothing. And, and more importantly, uh, you cannot have concurrency problems. So in, in, when, you work, when, when you work in that world, then that's really great. Uh, and a, ba a basic idea when you are designing and work, writing program in, in Haskell is to try to get to that pure core as fast as possible and leave the rest out because that's where uh, dragons are. Um, so the basic idea is that each business model is pure. It is it, it delegates what's called a bounded context uh, and is responsible for a single policy part where we have a bunch of events and a single model and all events are applied to the model uh, and. Um, Another important thing that we are dis we, we will distinguish commands from events. A command is something that comes from outside. They, I want to do this, for example, I want to apply for a loan. Uh, in our case, and then the business model should know, okay, if you want to apply to a loan, then there are business rules that say that you, need, you need to meet some conditions, and if that's okay, then we can emit an event, which say can return an event, which says, okay, loan applied or loan emitted or whatever. So the idea that events represent something that has happened in the past, they represent the past, something that is always true. You cannot reject events, you cannot, and events are always valid. If an event is invalid, then this means that everything is, the, the world is perfect. So you, you better stop your system and get back in time. Comments can be rejected. That's the main difference. Between them. Um, so, technically, well, so we are, we are, we, I still have two lines. Um, what we have is that we have, we have, we have our, the, our, the core of our model is actually two functions. The first function is what we call act, act takes a command, a model, and generates an event. And then we have the apply, apply takes an event, a model, and return an updated model according to this. Here. Very simple. Uh, this is Haskell 101. So, so if you know how to write a function like that, then you know how to invent yourself. And that's once that's something that, uh, that that's reason one, one of the reasons that uh, we, we, we have started using that model is that it's really a good fit for functional programming. It's, and it's really a perfect fit for a Haskell, now, in my opinion, because this is basically when you start designing about Haskell and when you start programming Haskell, you start to think in terms of immutable structures and how when you ch you, you never anymore mutate states, you just create a new state, so it becomes naturally you start to think in terms oh i got that state how do i go from that state to that to, the, to this state and then oh, there is a function in between well events is just a way of refining the function uh, that's a natural transition towards uh, towards um, and then we have effectful services so the services are uh, the services are represent um, more or less complex interactions with the outside world that can interact with several models uh, and uh, one important thing is that we don't have future to patients. So if you have an error somewhere, in, then you have to deal with at the place where it occurs. So you cannot say, I want to enforce integrity constraints across 10 models. If you want to do that, then you have to implement one service that is responsible for that, 
Okay, so the typical use case, the typical case, the typical, typical case for that is the classical transfer between two accounts. So you're transferring money between two accounts uh, actually can be something where you need some transactional integrity. But when you're modeling with an event, it's just one, one, one event, and then you don't have any more transactional integrity. So you, you, you actually, by, by, by forcing yourself to focus on some part of the, of the, of the domain, then you, you can live without enforcing integrity over all the domain. Uh, and, okay, that's a little bit more daunting, but not that much yet. Um, so we have, uh, for, so to express effectful services, we have a, a monad, um, and we have a structure which is the web, we call web state monad. Uh, it's actually a transformer, uh, so it should be a T, uh, And what this, what this monad is made of is that we have a global model, the G, which, which lives with, with it, which is bounded and which is encapsulated inside. Uh, STM. So to access the model from the outside world, you always need to run it into a, a, a STM transaction. So that, that makes sure that you that, that takes care of logs for you. Uh, then you have the local data, which is something that can that can be local to a single information service. And then you have the underlying model mod monad on which you uh, you work, which usually is IO. But we'll see maybe some example of using it differently than using something different than IO. For example, for testing. Uh, and then in the end, the storage of events is pretty easy. You have a very simple structure where you have uh, an event, and an event is something that uh, the most important the, the most important things in the event here are the event version, which is a monotony increasing number, which says what, once every every time we change the the schema of, of a single event, we increase <laughs> the version, and this means that we can reconstruct so. To do migrations, what, what we do is that we load all the events and we reinterpret the events from uh, older versions into the new, the, 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 the current version of the system. So that makes uh, migrations rather smooth. Um, and then you have a, a type which is, which is a classifier for the event, various metadata that you can use. The, I think they are, they are interesting because once you get events, for example, something that um, you get you, something that we recall for each event is that the user. So we, for each transformation of the system, we know uh, which, which authenticated user was uh, triggered that action. And we also know uh, the request ID, so the outside request ID, the, 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 the outside trigger that generates that event. This, mean, this means that we can have trace of, traceability between uh, various parts of the system and we can know that some request generated values even somewhere or triggered values, uh, values changes. And we even have something which is the, 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 the SHA-1. And the SHA-1 is actually the version of the code in which the event occurred. So we, we store the version statically when we, when we deploy the code. So we know, uh, even if it, it's, it's, it's more precise than the event version, the event version is schema, it's a logical version. This one is actually a natural code version. So this makes it easier sometimes to track that. That's the get reversion. Sorry? Is that the get reversion? Yeah. It's, 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 the, it's the git shower. That we want, basically. Um, and that's it. So, and so for storage, uh, the, 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 the good news is that we can uh, forego the use of a complex uh, database server. We only have the, our, 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 our events are stored in an append-only file on the file system. And that's it. So every, it's, it's a simple file, and we, we continuously write to the end of the file. Um, so it's very, I mean, if the file system goes bust, then probably you should stop everything. Uh, or not. Okay, enough talking. Uh, Amara? Um, I hope that's. No, it's okay. Yeah, it did? Oh, I don't know. Okay. I will just uh, yeah. I will just leave it nice. Okay. Just to give to to leave you a clean environment. Okay. So uh, uh, has it. 
dog uh, already talked about uh, that we should have two different things. One is more advanced users that are not already took took care of. Now I am I'm taking care of more uh, beginner beginner users, which are not, what what are not talked. Uh, what I am going to do is uh, try to try to show how how we can map to uh, map it or model it in a scale uh, three way. Uh, so what what I try to do is. Uh, just pulled out some simple uh, library from our code base, uh, minimalistic, I would say. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's in the live. Yeah. It's awesome. yeah. so, so, the most important uh, part of our <coughs> event sourcing or. Uh, Can you see at the back? It's a, it's a bit small? You mean too small? Yeah, it's a bit small. Can you increase that uh, more? that most of uh, you have already know what type, what type class is. And uh, uh, how we capture an event is uh, data coming in the type class, uh, so same for command and error. As I'm not mentioned, there are only two important functions in this business model, uh, act and apply. Actually, you, you could have an unapply function, uh, but then your event should be revertible, uh, like a git, git commits. Uh, that, that, that is really a recommended practice uh, we I'll talk about why and why that is important so what what act does is act simply takes a business model and a command and uh, and ru runs some business rule uh, if business will fail it will uh, return an error uh, otherwise it will return an event uh, apply is again a simple uh, it modifies the business model according to uh, according to the event event and there is an init which is a default business model because we, what we do is just fold over uh, we just create a state from state by folding over all the events to just to uh, some default uh, yeah that's it about the business model that's pretty simple actually uh, we can we can go and see how we actually use this uh, this uh, simple class and there are some uh, library functions that are downside uh, in our actual code uh, or like relatively like actual code. Uh, oh shit. <laughs> I need my <coughs> this mm, I mean I miss sometimes? I think so. Okay, so this is a, uh, so I thought it's a demo is a good domain to understand because it's a demo. So, <laughs> so yeah, this is a basic example of that, how uh, every, uh, every business model will look like. So, yeah, as I mentioned, there is a command, uh, which is indexed by the model itself. Uh, if they are external actions, and we add demo, of the table, it's as simple as a character without it. Uh, then event are immutable historical facts about our business model. Uh, which are which cannot be changed actually. So you can distinguish like this. Ex uh, commands are coming from outside. Events are generated by us, and we know that they are flawless. We can uh, we can apply it blindly to our business model or our states. Uh, errors again, I just uh, uh, algebraic data type, uh, some type. Uh, 
So basically, this is a, how we implement uh, act is just by pattern matching on all the command. Uh, we we validate validate uh, commands and the incoming data in the uh, acting. And if, if if it is successful, then we we, we create a immutable event which is which is related to that command. And if it is unsuccessful, then we just uh, we just return a related can tell smart. You can tell Slack to stop okay. the color and use this survey. Yeah, basically that's it. Uh, do you have any question on this uh, example? Then we can go to the services, how services are. Uh, uh, okay, come. Um, I, I have, we, we, we arrived late, but I was interested by the, the talk before where you mentioned that uh, you, you needed uh, talk for beginners and talk for, ad for advanced users. Uh, so maybe there are persons in this room that don't understand this code. Is this a case? Yeah, I mean, no, I really, it's, it's, how, how many, it's, it's how a many case, or no, it's fine? Yeah, I, I don't understand the code. Okay. I'm not a Haskell guy. The, the <laughs> real goal of this. I might be the yeah. start of my learning journey. <laughs> this is the start of the journey, but what I do is this is, um, uh, yeah, Amar, I just, I just wanted to verify that it was not... How many uh, of you can read the Haskell code? Okay, half of the room... Yeah, for them it's yeah. pretty easy. Okay, so <laughs> Don't talk about it, it's okay, I'll let you go over it. Yeah, okay. uh, yeah, so basically two functions we implement by pattern matching on the type, uh, sorry, a data family uh, event that come on. Uh, okay, just, just for those who really don't, don't understand, want to understand, I want to be sure that it's it's very simple actually because what you see here is just a description of what I mean the important thing is what art and apply do and what I can apply do it's actually just just a description of the function call for different parameters so we use something which is pattern matching and we pattern match on the different arguments and say okay if I have a demo view so demo view D is a structure which is called demo view and which contains a mapper which we which I call D it's a variable and I have a demo added with a demo object, then I can, so n is a map, and I can change the map, and, and the, the interesting thing that you can see here is that we are reconstructing a full demo view object. So we are really, it's not the same object, it's a new object. It's a different, and that's what makes the model immutable. Once you have a reference in the model, you know that it will never change. Sometimes. <laughs> Most of the time. Um. It sounded before as if you had like one global model, one big thing that, it's that where you record all the events. No, and no, no, you have many different models. Yes. We currently have something like ten. Eighteen, I think. Yeah, somewhere at like ten models. And then you can add one if you feel like it. Yeah, and yes. we, we continuously add new ones. So, for example, we recently added one for uh, emails. Email. Yeah, email. to manage emails. Uh, we are we are going to add. Well, each, I mean, the idea is that each time when we, each time when we are, we think that there is some, uh, well, it's, it gets pretty fuzzy. But the idea is that we don't want our models to get too big. We already have two big models. We only have too big. Where when you when you start to have say 15, 20 events, it starts to get a bit too big. Probably that's a smell that probably you are managing too many things at once. So yes, we split. We try to split models. Does it this answer the question? Yeah. Oh. Um, a, a follow up question. Yeah. Um, it, it, it sounds as if it would be very tempting to have, like, to allow two models for the same kind of event or the same kind of command. But here, for every model, you have just, like, every model has its own commands and its own events, right? And so, so for every, every single model, you need your own event store, right? Uh, no, that's not the case. We have some mechanism that we have actually a, a, we have a global grouping of models. It can get pretty technical. I, I could I could explain after maybe that would be. But then we have a way to group different models at a, at a high level in the application. Uh, but the only is the the the, the in the end is yes we can basically it, it, it's not really a problem if each model has its own store in the end because basically the store is just you just write. Store so you can have. I mean, if you have Android models and you have Android five, it's 
not, not a big deal. It's just a matter of, I mean, it's just a matter of ma maintain, maintenance and managing those files, but just plain files. Actually, we have, we have both the cases. We have grouping of uh, models uh, as well as they, they are some, some new models which we have their own stores because they don't relate to this core grouping of models. We are going to run the microservices Micro architecture. <laughs> Uh, but the idea is just to separate things. Uh, let me question about yeah. the uh, about the pattern matching there. Yeah. So if I understand the way to do scripting or wrong, um, we have a whole bunch of um, uh, events that you've added to the add them or the update them or the delete them or the demo added events. Yeah. And whenever you receive one of these events, you unpack the contained demo view object yeah. um, and then you do something with that. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, what I don't understand is the difference between act and reply. Uh, so act is uh, act is actually how we create those demo added updated and deleted events. So you can see that act actually takes as input a view and a command, and command and it generates what is output is is actually uh, an event. So this is a pretty complicated code, but well, not that complicated. But you have to hear the idea that you validate some some with some function you validate the the input, and then from that input you can generate different events. So act, act is, just, is a way to say, I'm, 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 set, I'm, I'm pushing a button, take, imagine that uh, to, to give uh, something more physical. You push a button in the machine, and, and you have a button, you push a button and it, it gives you uh, a ticket, and this ticket is actually a number that you have to enter into a, a pin path to change the state of the machine. So pushing the button doesn't change the state, it just has something that, okay, can you can I push that button? And then you take if you, you take the answer and you put it back to the machine. I'm not sure if the analogy is uh, but well, maybe maybe if, if I understand what apply does, does apply actually uh, do the action that yeah. yeah. So it apply it takes a model, right? It takes a word, it takes an event that should change the word and it returns a new word. Alright. Okay, two questions. The first one, I'm not sure if it's a sensical question, but because I'm not quite sure about how this all fits together, but what about interaction between models? So that's what I said before, the idea of interaction with models, that it's, uh, it's handled, there is the basic principle that there is no interaction between models. They live in isolated islands. What you can have is that you can have a service that interacts with two modes. Basic example, uh, you have, we have in the, in the platform, we have something that says... Uh, Suppose, uh, yeah. for example, user registers uh, that, that acts on user's model, that generates that user register, and on that generation of user register, we send an email. So, the same email is acting on different models. So, so our services are orchestr orchestrators between uh, different models. Each model is a, it's a, uh, it's an independent entity of your business. It shouldn't know about each other. Okay, so you never need to enforce like an intermodel consistency. You never need an event which only makes sense if there's some other event, another model as well. Or Actually, we probably need some form of consistency, but it's handled at the level of service. That's the idea. The idea is that no, you don't want something that ties two models. You don't. I mean, it's, it's, it's a matter of. It's a, it, it really it's a philosophical choice, right? If I can say. It's just say we don't want to do that because we want our models to be very flexible and ductile, and we want we want to make some. And we don't want to be. We 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 were close to building a big model, but we don't want to do that because it's it's more harder to change. And, uh, so the idea is that we, we refrain from doing that. So it's, it's kind of it's a it can be a straight jacket at times. But the idea is that the the, the, the advantage is that you get very very self contained and, and, uh, and flexible models. And all the other advantages that you can get. Okay, that does it. Uh, sure. uh, could you uh, give an example of the models uh, like real 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 life uh, scenarios of the models that you have defined here? Uh, and also uh, have you identified um, other definitions of models which which might not fit in this. Uh, so uh, going on with show after MRI, we show you some two three com concrete examples of what we do with that uh, of actual code that we use in production uh, and, and the way we are using those events for doing some special effects. Um, 
and said that that might be more uh, easy for you to, to grasp uh, the actual uh, model for your Sure. Um, the model in itself doesn't guarantee that I can end up in an ecosystem state, right? No. Because, right. As, as I understand, I can, beside, take, beside tax. I can take a demo model and have a, have a command in, in your space that basically grants alone, which basically returns like either true or false somehow. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't enforce that I um, put that event onto the same uh, uh, state, right? Because you, you, you're basically taking the, the state of your data, asking asking about that, and then we can generate, okay, you can get a load. But in, in the meantime, some other event came that said, okay, deduct the whole account. Uh, and then no, you apply no, that. No, because well, this, 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 the models are, are pure and are uh, not straight. Take this. Okay. So it's not possible to generate. I mean, a command generate. Okay. In in the functions you see there, that's not enforced. But in practice, that's that's enforced. We know that once we apply a command, we generate an event, and then we we imme immediately apply. Uh, okay. okay. It's, that's enforced. Yeah. At, but that's enforced at the level of machinery to to do the uh, to do the uh, to make it work out. So that's an interesting question because uh, I just realized that I didn't hear you mention uh, anything about uh, using aggregate IDs anywhere to uh, essentially uniquely identify any of your model instances. Um, the, what do you use um, as a sort of uh, the equivalent of an uh, aggregate ID from event sourcing or which corresponds to primary key in relational terms? We have, I mean, we have primary keys. I mean, the, if you can show the model on our Maybe the demo. Did it, I mean, the, the the demo view here. You look, it, it's a map. It's a map from a primary key to a, to a row. I mean, it, it's a map. It's a table. It just just it's a table, but actually it's uh, it's it's implemented. It's a table implemented as a map with a single primary key. Uh, we we have models where we have the same data with different indices. We have indices like that. So there is no magic. At some point, the data has to point. You have to find new. You have, you have to find users, so you need user IDs. You have to find nodes, but you have to find things. That doesn't change. Those principles doesn't change. What changes is only the way that you store that and how you reconstruct state from from from, from persistence. So in the end, the in the end, your your view is actually it can be pretty much anything. Most of the time, it's a map. Um, it can be several maps because we have a view which finds different things, and we need, for example, to do uh, um, some joins. Can happen, or so, or we are just managing two, two pieces of information for a single uh, a single type of object. Typically, a user. Uh, user, we are managing, for example, uh, author authorization tokens, and we are managing this profile as a user. So we have in the same view. It's the user view. We have two two tables. But it can be maps, it can be sets. Sometimes we have sets where we, we can have. The, the nice thing is that most of the time, because we are still in, the, in, the, in working with, uh, with some financial data and some uh, traditional, it, it basically it's, a, it's an accounting system. So we're, most of the time we are, we are modeling mentally our system as a table, or at least as something with a primary key to something with attributes, which is a table. But Sometimes, and we have the freedom to have sets, trees, uh, any kind of data structures that all to all that would be. And that became, that become very interesting sometimes. Not all the time, but sometimes it can, it can, it can become interesting. Okay, so... Uh, to, yeah, ju just one... Yeah, on sure. that side, what, what I've seen though, in database, in relational databases, is, for example, implementing a, a set, implementing a set as a table. Then you have to enforce a semantic set outside of the relational model because, or you have con integrity constraints or uniqueness constraints. Or so it works. You can do it, but it's 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 not. Okay. To me, it doesn't seem very natural because you have to somehow constrain the. But um, am, am I correct in saying that when you, in this case, the demo view, when you rehydrate or read back from your event yeah. model, that the whole the whole map or that whole table gets reconstructed in yeah. or do you individually for each of the aggregate objects allow, for example, the equivalent that I can think of is of reconstructing all of the user objects 
in memory, in a memory contained uh, data, data storage, yep. or uh, data structure, uh, as opposed to individually retrieving a person uh, from the database and having only that one object or the one individual person. So what we do is actually uh, we reconstruct everything. Uh, the, the, we, we apply, we form the root stream of events. Okay. Actually, it's a, it's a classical functional programming practice to use fold, which is a religious uh, transformation of the, of the and so we apply a fold, right? we, we, we fold apply on the stream of events to, a, to an empty model. And, uh, that, uh, so, and then we reconstruct the model. The thing is that, yes, this builds the hoop, usually this builds the hoop model in memory. What can happen is that if you have, if your model is chosen, if it has the right structure, you can take advantage of laziness. And then you, you, you sometimes you might not reconstruct all of your model. Or you might not reconstruct all the parts of your model to, um, um, all the time. So if you if you want a granularity which is higher than what you, if you want a smaller granularity than having the big chunk or big table, then you can split your model into different tables or different entities. And then the fact that when you apply an event, it's actually a function which is stored and which is applied lazily, will it will magically or at least somewhat magically do the work for you and you will only execute and load the code for you at once but there is a the thing is that because the loading the loading the reading on the file is sequential you won't you you, you won't um, you will still have to, to load all the fa the the raw data in the file to load it in the memory but you don't you are not first to reconstruct everything uh, do you do the checkpoint thing, or do you always start? Not yet. Okay. This, it's part of the plan, but we, we don't. The volume of data we have doesn't really. Yeah. Okay, so the this uh, this is the individual self-contained domain model. Uh, what we do is we just contain a state of uh, no, set, uh, we contain a state in memory of multiple domains model, domain model. I can show you how state look like. Uh, A simple a state is simple a collection of uh, collection of uh, different uh, views. There, there is only one view for now, but they can be multiple views. And what we do is uh, in service, uh, so, uh, so basically the, this is divided into uh, two parts. One is uh, how you compute your business uh, business domain, or how you comp uh, compute your business operation versus how you uh, store events and update in memory state, right? So computing the business model is taken care by the business model part and uh, storing and uh, updating the state is taken care by, this is our state, so updating the state is taken care by services. So I'll show you the type for service, how, how it roughly look like for us. So we, we have a simple transformer, uh, this one. So we have a simple transformer. Uh, okay, this is quite long thing, but what it does is uh, we just have a uh, in-memory state called yes, uh, which which is in TVAR. That's why uh, that's why we cannot have inconsistencies because uh, we can only have one operation, right operation running at one time, uh, at single point of time, and uh, we can handle errors using. Uh, but this is not our uh, real um, uh, model. How it looks. Like. That one is how I'm not uh, show the web uh, This is a simplified, supposed to be simplified version of it. So our service algebra looks like this, and our services are simply the programs written in this monad. So the, uh, this is our services. So creating demo is nothing but uh, the I'll show how what apply command. But nothing but apply 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 command takes care of both updating the state, uh, uh, updating the updating the state atomically plus uh, storing the event but these two things are not atomic uh, I mean updating the state in itself is not atomic two threads cannot update same state at one time that's uh, what you mentioned that's what the puzzling thing in your question actually yeah, yeah. you can have it because command technically command uh, act and apply are not atomic so you, if you have two acts in a row with a different with the same model and then they, they might generate different and then you can have its consistency. So the role of apply command is to ensure that act and apply are actually active. Uh, yes, and also, also
also uh, you can see that they had some CRUD with read, uh, without read operation and they, they are read operations which are, which are nothing but reading from the freeware of his, uh, which is again you, 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 because of HTM, uh, HTM's optimistic locking you can you can have multiple readers at the same time. You have two threads doesn't need to be waiting if neither of them is uh, writing. Uh, yeah, so uh, so this uh, basically this this read operation is we can take uh, example of all demos how we what we do is just uh, read the key where obvious and just filter uh, whatever 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 computation or whatever filter you want to apply to whole state you apply it here and and uh, return the result. Uh, the most interesting part here is apply command. Oh yeah, apply command operates in a, again a service. Uh, oh sorry, not this one. Apply command operates in a service transformer. Uh, what it does is basically only two things. As I said, it, it automatically applies or uh, updates the state uh, using the generated event. I go to that and kind apply. Of and also, it stores event uh, stores event to the file system. Uh, the the uh, catch here is these two operations are not atomic. You can see there can be chances where uh, apply command is succeeded, but store is failed, and then you don't have any any anything to hold back. Uh, that's why that's why that's why I mentioned uh, when I uh, when I when I uh, demonstrated the business model, you might need uh, git like commits uh, as events where you you have an apply function. I remember uh, Sonke suggesting a vector patches library that that. Uh, we might try in future, but not now. Uh, not in currently. Currently, our state can be in. Actually, store can be inconsistent with state. Uh, apart from that, it's pretty good. Uh, things I can show the. Uh, yeah, if if event fails, uh, what if command fails to apply, we just uh, throw error in our except except owner. In real life, uh, in the actual production code, we don't form inconsistencies. So what we do is that we serialize. Uh, you have a queue to serialize actually yeah. command application, uh, command acting application and story. So if it, if any of this fails, then this this three operation are done. Uh, this is where we are reading on. Uh, as, well, it's not a limit; it's a little bit in future of Haskell. But the fact that we we have a model that is in memory, so we can act and we can manage it with STM, so we're looking, but we cannot do IO with STM. How do you make? Uh, how do you ensure that you are actually uh, atomically updating your model and storing your data? Because if you don't store your data, then that's just like you are not uh, updating your model. So that's why we are using a, a server, we, we, we serialize different commands. What's the benefit of using STM in that case? Um, it's because for our reads, for reads. Uh, read operations are not in that mechanism, so they can be run concurrently, and we can still ensure that we don't have that same thing. And then um, you can have uh, you can have several atomic packages run concurrently. Still, the, w the one thing that we don't want to occur is uh, well, I'm sorry. I'm, um, actually, there is another mechanism for that. So it could go a bit too far. But the, the nice thing with STM is that you can have at some time two, 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 two events uh, that are written. In the, once the event is written, that's done atomically and can be done in concurrent threads. And so then we can, we can have a little STM. Yeah. So this, uh, this is a state approach. State update uh, which is, as you can see, it, it sits in HTML, so the whole code is atomic. So, uh, also, if this code, code is let's say that uh, well, two threads cannot modify uh, one business model uh, at a time. Uh, that's it, I would service. Uh, we are already out of time. And yeah. I just show <laughs> some uh, wiring of E to how we wire it. Uh, okay, but this is irrelevant to event sourcing, so I'll just leave it here. Go ahead.
So we wanted to show you some actual use of uh, we make of, of events that are somewhat specific to the, to the fact that we are using events. Uh, uh, and that's what uh, going on with we will actually show you. Uh, so usually how the uh, events are created mm -hmm. with the ultimate goal of the updating the state is that going through the business model, the user makes a request that this uh, goes through some business logic and uh, it gets uh, identified as an event and the uh, like event gets stored and that affects the state but uh, sometimes we might want to do some data patching uh, which we haven't written the business logic for in, in the code so something we can do is to inject events directly uh, if we know how because uh, there's a state we want to get to and the state we have right now and instead of uh, going through the business model business logic to arrive at that state which is intended which we haven't um, got the feature implemented for we can just inject the event directly so for example when we want to change the investor type from an individual investor to a corporate investor um, we don't have the spe specific uh, update investor a change investor type uh, command but we so happen to have the uh, update investor uh, command over here and this uh, is pretty brute force way to update the investor. Basically, it says that the investor is now this. We previously, so it allows arbitrary changes to the investor. Uh, so we get the investor up here. This is just to convert the investor ID uh, from the email. But once you have the ID, we get the investor. And when we get the investor, we we do the changes of the investor data type, and with the new investor, uh, we update the basically we update the investor at that uh, investor ID with the new investor. So um, this is essentially the same way you will update the state which is to issue an event but instead of going through the commands of doing all the validation you you do it the unsafe way I suppose uh, which is what you will do with data patching the nice thing with the fact that we are in so it's just this is not what we do normally it's just sometimes so we have we the fact that we have the, we have the application, we have built the, the command line client. So sometimes, I mean, sometimes something somebody makes an error, which is not a technical error, but it's a practical error. And then we need to change data, or we need to change something, we need to change uh, something that's not that we didn't need to be changed. So that's what one advantage, one disadvantage of our system that if you have not something that says you can change that, and you have not the exact command, then you screwed. You can't change it. Period. And you cannot go, you cannot do it uh, easily. Uh, but the other, on the other hand, if you have something which is more general but not open, not open to everybody, but you can use as a kind of, of, of a generic event or generic command, then you can actually use it to control where to to patch some human errors and still get guarantee that no event is lost or no, and not, and it, you, you still get the fact that. It just imagine that you're, you you got a database in production. Nobody changes data in production using SQL, except sometimes you do, right? And sometimes you do, and guess what? When you do that, usually it's got surprises, or you got somebody who gets uh, who made a big error, and you have to do it right now. And so you you have to do, it. and uh, you do it. And the problem with with the database is that this change gets lost. It, it, it has been changed and that's it. The fact what we are doing here, we do the same, we do something ugly and patch data in production, but 
we have the advantage that it's done in a more frontal way. We know that we have changed the data, and it's, it's part of the history of the database. So we can track the events yeah, in a way. So this makes actually the system really irritable. It, even if we leave some back doors to be able to patch data in production, which we always do, we can do it in a controlled way. Uh, so we have a bunch of those scripts which are used that we use from time to time to to to, to change well to, to, to really do some tiny change here and there. Uh, the advantage of uh, doing it with uh, you you don't have to with uh, uh, with tables you do <coughs> the um, edits directly in a flat way. You basically have to calculate exactly the patch you want to make and then issue the patch. But with a script to compute the new event to inject, you can actually use all the pure functions you already have, which you know have certain invariants and which makes sense, transforms the data in a sensible way. You just compose it differently in the script. Um, so even though you, the way you compose it is not currently how it is in the business model. Uh, you can, for example, this here scales the transaction. Um, you doing it by hand, and you will have to, uh, I don't know, use a calculator and then uh, inject the data, but in a raw fashion. But here, you can just get what the transaction is currently in the state, apply the scale transaction function and then you get the result and then inject the uh, update transaction event in. So basically what we are doing is that we, we can do SQL in Haskell. Except that it's Haskell. So we are we have a we have a bunch of SQL scripts, but we are doing Haskell. We are manipulating our data in Haskell. Maybe you can show the last one which is ammunition, uh, which can be uh, uh, so something that we do, for example, is that for testing purpose or local usage, we have an immunization of the database. We, we, we take the approach in the database and we run an immunization over that database and we scramble all the we, we scramble number names, numbers, emails, whatever, a lot of different personal data. And uh, what we get is that the, the nice thing is that you can see here in action the fact that uh, to get Actually, to, to change the database, it just, we take a stream of events, of stored events, we apply some transformation functions, and we get a new stream. And this stream can be stored as another database, which can directly be used. So uh, that's something which is interesting, for example, for animation, for filtering, and when you want to trim down the database, you, 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 can, you can back, get back in time. Take the, take the database, and for example, it's very easy for, it to, for example, to take a snapshot a, a snapshot of the transaction at at some date because we get we roll back the we, we roll back the data to the database and say we issue the query for example to say balance of all accounts and that's it and we can do it all the time for all the for any kind of data so that's the kind of thing that we do with uh, with uh, the data. you have a question uh, not really a question I just think you should stress more that you because you know of the user for every event. In, in retrospect, you can see who changed what. So you basically have yeah. accountability for all your data yeah. in your system. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mentioned it. In the beginning, but in that point where you yeah. said you, we can patch. Uh, yeah, because oh, it, 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 actually, yeah, I didn't mention it, but actually, when, what we do is that we connect to the system, we, you are identified, it's not a backdoor. Uh, uh, we, yes. we, are, we are going through the API of the system, except it's an administration API, but you are identified. So if Amar connects with Spinential, I know that Amar changed some data somewhere, or I changed some data somewhere. And that's, yeah, I, I didn't mention that, but uh, yeah. Um, how does it work to execute a script like that if your model is in memory in some process? Everything is in memory. The model is always in memory. When, when we do something, okay, in, in that case, no. I mean, addition, no. But for example, when 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 uh, Goyan was doing some uh, some transaction inflation, yes, we load the model, we reconstruct the model in memory. But then, why you do that? Your website is down. Or how does that work? I don't know why. Why? Because you end up with a new model. 
No, it just means there's new events in. No, I think I, I, what I what practically what we do is that we we connect to the website to the application. We retrieve all the events so far. We reconstruct the part of the model that is interesting for us at that time. It can be all the model or it can be some part of the model. Yeah. We hack on it, generate a new event. Obviously, this is a less control because we don't go through the locking, verification, whatever. So it's, it's not something that you would do for normal usage, but it nevertheless goes through some, it nevertheless, uh, it, 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 it goes at the run at runtime. If you inject an event which can potentially be conflicting, then that's potentially a bug, of course. But, but how, how does your, your main application then get the event? Oh, there, there is an API for that. Okay. There is an API for injecting, injecting events. Actually, there is an API for injecting events and there is an API for injecting comments. What's the first thing you What's the first thing you yeah. So if you are storing everything in memory, yeah. um, isn't that a bit of a big limitation? Because I can imagine like if I want to some kind of quote unquote table, you know, table equivalent in your data in data store with a billion rows and the key is gonna be on int sixty four, so that's eight bytes, and then the value is gonna be at least another eight bytes. So that's 16 gigs of RAM just for that one thing. And, and that's a pretty small table. Like yeah. I can imagine if, if your values are email addresses, then, then it yeah. might be quite a bit bigger. So, yeah, that, that's definitely that's, um, this, this kind of stuff is not really meant, probably not meant for when you got, I say, big data, whatever that means. But, uh, the currently we are we are using DigitalOcean as our uh, as our provider. The biggest machine that we can have on DigitalOcean is 96 gigabytes of data of RAM. And uh, what we are doing now is that we are splitting the models. So this means that we can actually distribute the models. So each model, uh, the the limitation, the conceptual limitation we have is that a single business model cannot be larger than 86 gigabytes, or assuming that we are using only distortion. If we go to, uh, if we use EMIs from uh, from Amazon, I guess that they can provide something like, I don't remember the exact figure, but it can go to 200 or 300 gigabytes. Both get, get expensive pretty fast. Of course, but if you, if you have that, I mean, if you have the usage at runtime of that much data, then probably at some point you are going to probably own your own machines or your own data center or whatever. I don't know. I, I, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure about what I say. But I say that for the foreseeable future, for us, I mean, for the next, I'm pretty sure that for the next two three years, that's okay. I'm not. I'm, that's not. Uh, that doesn't mean that for you it might not be okay. <laughs> I, I don't really understand the problem. Can you, can you explain? You've got an event log which can be big, and then you've got the model, which is the state, right? Are you saying, I'm saying a model that's big, okay. like, say, Facebook. Facebook's an extreme example. They've got a, a billion users, right? And, and even if you're not very big, I can still imagine all kinds of tables that would have a billion rows. Yeah, and that's, that's when we get to this, this level of numbers. When you get to that level, anyway, 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 when you get to that level of massive amount of data to manipulate the right time, you have to use uh, sharding, you have to, do, to use uh, uh, splitting your model into the other, and even conventional use, you have to use some techniques to do that, and you have to shard the data. Well, but, but not if you're storing on disk, if you, because disks are way, way bigger than RAM. So we can, we could have a terabyte on disk, yeah. Yeah. and then we could have a, a really small machine, so it, it seems like you're kind of moving your uh, things that, would, would be limited by disk size, now you're limited by RAM size, so you kind of jumped but the order of RAM is a new list. Can't, can't you start <laughs> checkpointing at that point? Yeah. Because so then you just... No, but it's a different, the it's a different the problem. The, uh, it's a different yeah. problem. Yeah. What, what you're mentioning... Do... Yeah, yeah. yeah Doug. What, what Doug mentions is that you can have very big models, not very big persistent store, because even, so even us, we can have very large stores. But that when the store is loaded, maybe it's just 
we just have a million of events for the same tiny bit of the model, and then the model itself is very small. Yeah, but then you don't need to keep the whole reason. There are, sorry to interrupt. There are two things which I guess you could literally cover in your talk about um, event sourcing. Um, one is that uh, is the idea of CQRS, which is the one query responsibility okay. separation. And the, 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 the talk is not finished. All right. <laughs> good, thing, uh, good because if you're talking about the query side, that solves part of the problem. The other, the other thing, of course, is that uh, not all event sourcing models uh, actually hydrate the entire data model into memory. Um, so, for example, some actor-based uh, 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 event sourcing systems will associate an aggregate ID with a particular instance of a domain object, or in other words, it will associate an aggregate ID with a row in your table, uh, and that row in your, in your data, in your table, in your, the equivalent of a row in your SQL, in your relational table, will change over time, and each event that updates over time will be appended to the event log, and then when you reconstruct just an instance of that domain object with that aggregate ID, only the events applying to that aggregate ID are replayed from the event log so that your final aggregate state that you end up with only for the small domain object in memory is basically the realized state with the whole ordered log still in the back. So in that kind of system and for scenario, you don't have to reload it to load it. That's basically sharding. It's basically sharding your model. So when, when you have a model, I mean, say, user profiles, uh, user profile, and at some point you are forced to shard your data if you want to manipulate it in some way, and, and to have it accessible in some way. And this always happens, it's happened all the time. Uh, even if you're, I mean, if you are, um, if you are uh, one, of the, one, of the big, one of the big players, I mean, even not that big players, but if you have, thousands or, or hundreds of thousands of requests that we gave for different users, in the end, the, 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 hot, uh, the, uh, the hot part of data is getting close to get all your, all your data. You need to access profiles of users all the time, so you can't store it in this. So you have to get it somewhere in memory. So that's why you get some, maybe some memory integrity or whatever to manage some, some, some caching. Or you, have, you have plenty of techniques for doing that. What we do is, is it's basically a cache. We are busy with caching, and at some point, if we, if we, if we encounter that condition that, well, one model is too big, then maybe, yes, we are going to split the model, but it can be split logically, that different models and different events are, are just scaled down, or it can be split across the model using sharding. That's something that, yeah, we are... Honestly, if I had uh, 240 hours a day and... Uh, but. We don't have the problem right now, so I'm not going to solve that. I, I know how to solve it. So when we will have it, uh, we'll hire 10 developers and build the, the new store. And, but right now, I know how to solve it, but I, I, we don't solve it. Just for the scale, what is the, the memory that your largest model uses? The, the largest? Model. Uh, I don't know. Is that, I, I, I don't have the, 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 the current memory footprint of the application itself. It's uh, Three, uh, three, four. Okay. So it's very small. I mean, we are a startup, you know. <laughs> I mean, and we, we are not. We are not an online. Uh, we we are not a B two C or B two C startup. So we don't have uh, hundreds of requests per second. We we have a small user base. We want we want to. We are more focused on integrity, uh, security, and getting things right with the model and competition that being able to scale very easily. So we didn't, uh, we didn't tackle, the, we have not tackled the problem. Right. Um, I'm confused about the uh, fundraising and reconstruct. Yeah. You mean, you have generated a new model, yeah. based on the whole model. Yeah. Like, if you make, just making a okay. single, a change to just a single uh, yeah. row, yeah. so you, you have to Yeah, the, 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 the ID, yeah, yeah. yeah. But the idea is that if, if, my, if the structure of my model is well formed, actually what I just changed, what I just have to change the spine in the model. Because uh, if I change the outer object, the outer pointer, it, let's talk about pointers. <laughs> Those are pointers. So I have a pointer and I have a chain of pointer in my structure. If I change something somewhere in the leaf, obviously I have to change only the chain of pointers leading to my leaf. So yes, 
it's costly, but once again, it's costly if you do it uh, a million times per second. But uh, it's something that we, we can afford to do right now. And by the way, Haskell is garbage collected, so that's something that did, I mean, those old references are garbage collected over over time. So it's just a matter of it's it's not efficient. And uh, it's much less efficient than doing uh, in-place editing or in-place uh, mutation of the variable, except that sometimes under the hood, that's what it does. But, uh, don't but uh, it works. It works. And it's, it's, and it's very simple. Conceptually, very simple. And then we let we let Haskell take care of the, of the gory details of the runtime garbage collection, reference counting, uh, uh, thread management, whatever. Uh, but we yes, we do something very simple. And really, I mean, um, I've been working with the Java world, and I have, I, I have stopped working in Java when, uh, when I wanted to know what those uh, minus x, x flags were, and how many of them there was, and what each was doing, and how I can treat the, the size of my new generation garbage collector to be... So I say, okay, uh, I don't have that problem now, I don't want to touch that, we do something simple. And this is very efficient for us. Uh, this is not a silver bullet, but I, I'm pretty sure that it can scale quite well. And it can scale. And once we reach some limits, then we can start applying some classical techniques of distribution, so distributing to, 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 to distributing to different machines, sharding, uh, and uh, that I mean, we can we can get we can push a little farther. And that, just like you said, actually we can we can diminish the granularity of each instance of, of each size uh, of the model of the of model and, and get a single event tree per 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 aggregate if we talk in terms of um, yeah. so uh, I I think we have exploded the one really limit. I would just talk about future works uh, and so we had a, a pretty lengthy discussion about this slide which doesn't probably mean anything and I, I'm saying I mean we should try to uh, attribute to the film which doesn't mean anything also. so uh, or, or it, it means everything so uh, what I wanted to explain to express in that slide is that we are we are trying to push that model a bit far and trying to really understand and tr trying to go uh, we won't we, we, we are thinking that we think that this this way of thinking is really fruitful for us and will make us evolve into something different. And rather than having a monolith, okay, it won't be a monolith, it would be a bunch of services, but the idea is the same. So we, are, we, we think that we are just at the beginning of the road of evolution, on, of our evolution as a team to, towards something that will be much more manageable. My, I'm, actually, I'm, 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 I'm obsessed with, uh, I'm much more obsessed with the uh, speed of deployment and speed of delivery of features than with the actual performance, because that's what I'm asked to do. Uh, so, guess what? Yes, you're right. Uh, once you have an inserting which is optimized for writing, then maybe you can say, well, SQL was cool. Uh, we love it writing SQL, and we think that writing queries in SQL is much better than SQL, but sometimes a lot of users might not, different users might have different point of view on that. So, yes, with, with, uh, with something that we are thinking about is, take advantage of our relevant stream and then reconstruct different kinds of models and for example having uh, um, a real model that could be a relational database that people that could be populated so that's that's what why I'm, I'm talking about getting better at CQRS so really using our event store and our, our event stream to construct real only database and real only use uh, make models more resilient so we're thinking about going to starting to, to, to get Replication formulas to be sure that we have some full tolerance uh, and uh, be able to maintain strong consistency across models. So um, I'm exploring several definitions of RAFs and Haskell to see what we can do with that. Um, and then yes, I, I have too much spare time. So uh, and then we have something which is really f funny, and I would love to do that, but I'm pretty sure that it won't be done. Uh, this year or I mean, even the next year, but that could be really fun. I, I mean, it could be really fun from a technical perspective and really game-changing from business perspective. Is actually what we have is a is a transaction log. Is it? It's a ledger, and this ledger is pretty technical right now, but it contains actual business data, and 
it says that somebody did something at some time and maybe sometimes it says that somebody did something with something with somebody else at some time so we, we start to have that something that is that could be contractual so the idea would be to uh, there is a project called Juno which is, uh, which, which is very interesting which implements smart contracts uh, using um, a ledger which with cryptographically signed events so the idea is that if you have it's just like a blockchain if you are if you do a connection between two persons then you 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 sign the connection with your with a, with a, with a, um, your uh, your uh, private key and then you sign the event itself and you sign the, and you hash you sign the event with the hash of the previous events so you get an unforgeable uh, an unforgeable lock and um, the idea, and then once we get there, then we can imagine that it gets possible to prove that up to the limits of uh, uh, break, breaking RSA uh, or, or the, the usual limits of cryptography, it can be possible to prove that somebody did something in the system. And not only to prove by saying, hey, you could have done whatever you want with the banks. No, that, that's fine. So there, there are already a, 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 a lot of questions. I don't know if you have more questions. Uh, I guess there are other jokes. Uh, maybe we can leave room for the other jokes. Uh, and maybe, I don't know. If you have pressing questions, otherwise we can talk a bit after. The so one question would be, did you provide the, this draft implementation of the, of the business model as a package for others to use or is it totally internal for capital management? Currently it's totally internal because it's ugly. <laughs> Honestly I'm not I mean I, this is something I wrote at the beginning of Capital Match and you know we all learn. <laughs> so no I think it could be really improved and one way to improve it would be yes to open source it. So that could be something yeah. So we, we have started to do some mm, some open source projects here and there but which are very small uh, very small scale. Uh, and we have started to contribute here and there, but uh, you know we are we are pretty shy and uh, we we have a, so that impostor syndrome complex. That, uh, so yeah, we that that could be something interesting. On on the other hand, the core is, I mean. What I'm show, what I'm uh, I've shown you is is really what we have. I mean, it's, it's just adapted it a bit, but it's very close to what we have in production. So the core is very simple. I, I don't know if it's, I mean, it's more pattern than the actual library. Right? So I don't, I don't know if it's really relevant. What would be interesting would be the store inside. It, w once we get something that's more interesting, but there are already even stored out there. Not a couple of them, not many. Couple of them. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, apologies for the uh, uh, time. <laughs>